Hello, everybody. Welcome in to the NBA front office show. It is a new week, and we've got a lot to dive into revolving around the NBA playoffs, some offseason stuff as well. Before we get into everything, do me a favor over on the NBA front office YouTube channel. First of all, subscribe if you haven't. We've almost hit, hit 25,000. Help us out with getting there. Hit the subscribe button, but also do me a favor right now. Hit the like button. Just want to see what, what that does for us here. Hit that like button. Let's see if we get a bunch of people to smash the like button and see what that does for today's video as we work to continue to become not the best kept secret in the NBA potosphere. But I am Trevor Lane. You can find me on Twitter at Trevor underscore Lane. Joined by Keith Smith at Keith Smith NBA. Keith, uh, it was a wild weekend uh, around the NBA. A lot more stuff going on in the first round of the playoffs. We had a, a series come to a conclusion. And we've got a lot more that are really getting exciting. This is just a really fun time of year for NBA basketball because you have so many just great games on all the time. There have been some blowouts too, but some really fun ones. Uh, we even saw what Denver and Minnesota went to overtime. So I'm having a blast right now just watching all the basketball I possibly can. Yeah, we had our last eight-game weekend this past weekend because the uh, um, Sixers won. And we've got a couple other series that are on the verge of being wrapped mm -hmm. up. So, yeah, so we're definitely in a spot where we're running through the first round. And then, you know, quite often it's the second round is where things get really good, right? That's when you kind of get rid of those couple teams that are maybe they're okay, but not so great. And, and that's, you know, a lot of fun. So, yeah, I'm super excited for where it is. It's also a fun time because – we're starting to get some off-season stuff a little yep. bit, right? Like we're hearing there's a little bit of news about a Memphis and a little bit out of Brooklyn about mm -hmm. what maybe they might be looking at this summer. Um, we're starting to see a lot of draft stuff come out, like all that stuff. So, yeah, it's a, it's a fun time of year. It's an extremely busy time of year because yes. I'm trying to you know keep tabs on everything that's going on. But it's, uh, yeah, man, it's it's great. You can't ask for anything more right now. All right, well, let's start with a major positive. Let's start with a, with a great story. Giannis Antetokounmpo back for the Milwaukee Bucks. Obviously, one of the best players, if not the best player in the NBA. Great to hear that he will be back in action. Now, the Bucks, though, they're down 2-1 in the series to the Miami Heat, largely due to the absence uh, of Giannis Antetokounmpo. And the Heat have been, been playing well also. But you no know, Giannis, that makes a big difference for Milwaukee. So, Keith, I posed this question the other day when it was 1-1. If Giannis came back, if you would still pick the Bucks to win the series, or no, maybe it was one zero at that point. Yeah, I think it was um, one zero. He, yeah. but now it's two one. Giannis comes back. Are you still picking the Bucks to win the series? If he's Giannis, right? Because if he's just out there to be out there, he's not a very good decoy. This isn't like you're saying, hey, just go stand in the corner because you'll pull a defender with you because right. you're that good of a shooter. So that part, I'm a little like, nah, he's got to be Giannis. And if he looks like Giannis, then yeah, I'm going to pick the Bucks to win. I think they'll get it. They'll they'll even it up and they'll, they'll I'll probably pick him to win in six, right? And and take care of it in the next uh, uh, three games here. But if he can't be himself, and obviously that means the Heat win, then I'm going to lean towards the Heat. I, I think this is a huge game because you don't want to yeah. be down 3-1, even though you still would have a couple games left at home. Because now you're talking, we we got to you know, win. Not impossible in that scenario because you do have the two home games, but that, that's a really tough spot to be in. So big, big game tonight, and it looks like Milwaukee will be mostly whole, and they really need that. And you'd have to – this would be a shock if, if Milwaukee were to go out in the first round. I mean, this is the team that – I don't know if they were the favorite to win it all. They may have been, though. Uh, I didn't look at the betting lines to see who was the favorite to win it all heading into the playoffs, but Milwaukee would have been one of the top two at the very least um, for them to go out in the first round, man, that would change things completely uh, exactly. in the Eastern conference in, in the playoff race. So we'll see if Milwaukee can get, get it done and get back on track. If healthy, I still like them to potentially be the, the representative in the, in the uh, NBA finals from the Eastern conference. I think they've got a shot at it, but certainly now a lot more question marks than we had at the start of the playoffs. Yeah, and you know, and then you look at the you know the rest of these. It looks like Boston's going to get through Atlanta. Um, probably they'll probably close mm -hmm. that out in five, is my guess there. And then you've got the Sixers. All of a sudden, Joel Embiid maybe not even yeah. ready to go for the start of the second round. And if he is, is he going to be Joel Embiid? What's he going to look like out there? We've seen him kind of try to play through injuries before, and it seems like dad never goes well uh, for him or for the Sixers. And then the Knicks are up three, one on the Cavs. So it could, we could yeah. 
legit get to the second round with a banged up Sixers team and then Boston, Miami, and New York as you know what, what's left. And that, you know, if you're a Celtics fan, if that was the situation, you have to be looking at it and saying, if we don't make it to the finals, this whole season was a complete disappointment. Oh, yeah. That's what it is. Yeah, the, the runway to... is clear at that point. If yeah. if that's if that's the scenario, yeah, the runway yeah. is clear for a, a, a straight shot into the finals. Yeah, for sure. But we'll see where it goes. You know, I think, you know, the Knicks are in the driver's seat now. They're up 3-1. Mm-hmm. I know they're going back to Cleveland. But, again, you have that buffer. You could lose that game and you're still going back home, you yep. know, where they played really well. And then uh, Philly's already through. Boston get through. And then we'll see what happens. You know, maybe Milwaukee-Miami ends up being the unexpectedly long series in the East. You know, the only disappointing part of the first round, aside from, you know, there have been some blowout games. That's But that that's always going to happen when you get, you know, one versus eight type of matchups, sure. right? Um, but – the only, the only other thing has been the number of injuries. I mean, yeah. Paul George was already out, but then you've got Kawhi, Giannis, now Embiid, right? A, a Tyler Hero, Victor Oladipo, who we need to talk about as well. Like it, yeah. there's been a lot, and I'm sure there's some that I'm that I'm leaving off right now. There's been a lot of injuries here, not even just pr- before the playoffs started, but in the first round that have been devastating for teams. So, Adam Silver once again. Go back into settings, switch off injuries, please. We want to see these teams compete at full health because man, this has been this has been crazy how many injuries we've seen in the first round to two key players. Yeah, we always say the playoffs are a you know, it's a battle of attrition in a lot of ways where you just whoever makes it to the end healthiest is, you know, in really good shape. But it's it's just not good right now with, with these uh you know teams where these guys are just, you know, they're banged up in I mean, a lot of these injuries happened in the first weekend of the playoffs, you know, yeah. and it's like we, we didn't even make it into the second weekend of the playoffs healthy. So that's that that's a tricky, tough spot to be in. So yeah, I'm I'm a little you know, more, more than a little nervous that, you know, what's it going to look like by, by the end? Are we going to be yeah. calling up uh, San Antonio and Charlotte and like, hey, we need you guys to, like to <laughs> jump in there? because Bar- you know, Borrow a few players like your rec right? league team when you only have four yeah. guys show up or yeah. whatever. Hey, can we borrow a couple players from yeah, your team? Like, hey, can we just play fours today? Yeah. Uh, we're, we're like three half courts, 21 half court. we'll two. <laughs> I think that infringes it. upon the big three, but yeah. But yeah. Probably. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. But yeah, yeah, yeah it is. It's tough, man. And again, like we say all the time, whoever wins the NBA title, you earn it because you know you, you made it through. You know, health mm-hmm. is a, a big factor in it as well as talent. So yeah, but Oladipo, you've already got it up on the screen. Yeah. Awful. Like this is the injury out of all of them, probably the least impactful in terms of status within his team, but just sucks the most out of all of yes. it. Because it's like this guy has worked so hard to get back and and he never got back again to that all NBA level like he showed with the Pacers that one season but he was playing pretty well he had been out of the heat's rotation they they you know cut their rotation down and gone with other guys but he was still somebody that was like man this guy can still bring it and play was playing well when put back in the rotation and then goes down and he knew it right away too you just see him kind of sitting on the ground holding his knee basically saying no 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 good and you know they ended up helping him walk off rather than stretching him off but yeah. uh, now it's come out torn left patella tendon uh out for you know probably i think the reporting from shams was today six months six at months. least yeah but that's i mean that to me would seem like the optimistic timeline and mm-hmm. if everything goes well with his rehab and you know and if and if and if and if and if and knowing you know his history of you know, the way he's come back before, I'm not going to doubt that he can do it, but just really, really tough. Yeah. I mean, I was having this conversation with my wife yesterday, who's her degree is in, is in physical training and, and all that. And, and so she's, uh, she saw the Oladipo injury and she was like, it's, it's amazing how some people like their bodies just don't hold up the way that, that other people do. Like some people just, they're just naturally, you know, more prone to injuries and you just get this kind of random stuff. And it's always terrible when you see it in, in guys who are professional athletes and their bodies just say, I, I don't want to play. <laughs> I'm not, I don't want to play basketball at this level on a consistent basis. Cause it just feels like Victor Oladipo just can't catch maybe a break is the wrong term to use, but can't seem to stay healthy. And it's terrible for, for him, for a guy that's been really good in the league and is trying to hang in there and everything. And I don't know what this is going to mean for his future and what that's going to look like. Hopefully he's able to come back at hundred percent, but seeing that kind of injury happen to him, it's like, Oh man, not, not again with him. Yeah, absolutely. Just, you know, stinks. And 
hate to make it about this, but it's part of what we do here. He has a player option for next season, nine uh nine million four hundred and fifty thousand. We almost guaranteed he will pick that up now. He's probably going to pick it up anyway, but now he picks that up, and that's just you know, an, an increasingly expensive Miami roster uh, yeah. with some key free agents to resign. Max Struess, Gabe Vincent, two guys who are starting for them, are free agents this year coming off minimum deals. So they're going to get uh, you know healthy raises, whether it's with Miami or somebody else. They are you know, they're, they're, it's something they're going to have to work around. I would not be surprised if they almost treat that as, Day, we're going to put him into a deal of salary matching and you know well, you, you can go rehab with another team or mm-hmm. it might be one of those deals where the other team waves him and then he can return to Miami to rehab with them that's the way it works in the NBA he suffered the injury with the heat so he'd always be able to go back and rehab with them if, if uh, uh, even if he was traded and then waived but just a you know, really awful awful spot for for Victor Oladipo who's generally one of the nicest guys in the league yeah. too just you know, super super guy now, there. this is a bigger conversation for another day, but the Miami Heat, they're offseason. Whenever we get to that point, obviously they're still playing right now, but it's going to be one of the more fascinating ones around the league because I'm not sure what they're going to do here with, with this yeah. roster moving forward and what this is going to look like, particularly, as you said, as it gets more and more expensive. So, again, that's a conversation for another day, but something that we'll get into this offseason, I think they're going to be a team to keep a real eye on because – kind of feels like something needs to give here with with yeah. Miami and we'll see what that is. Yeah, um, yeah. I, yeah, that's a conversation for another day, but you're right, definitely big decisions coming uh there for the Heat. All right. DeJounte Murray, what are you doing? After the Hawks lost to the Celtics, he gets in the face of the official, makes physical contact with the official uh, has to be held back by teammates at one point. He had moved away from the official at, at that point, but still was being ushered off the court by teammates and everything. But he does bump the referee. Now the NBA is reviewing it. Who knows, by the time this show is actually published, we may have news on what the NBA is going to do, if anything, in this situation. But you, you, just, you cannot make contact with officials, period. You can't do it. And this is a terrible decision for DeJounte Murray. What a mistake to make that could prove to be very, very costly. Again, I'm not expecting the Hawks to win this series or anything, but but my goodness, if DeJounte Murray can't play their next game, start planning your vacation, Atlanta, because this is this could be a huge loss for them and just a, a, a bonehead decision from DeJounte Murray. Yeah, it's so I'll just stick to the DeJounte Murray stuff to start off with here because you're absolutely right. You can't do this. And this was done, <clears throat> excuse me, after the game where yeah, he – Yeah, that's right. You know, the game had just literally just ended. Uh, he would happen to be, he was at about the top of the key. The referee was at about half court and he just went right up to him, got right into his, you know, face and really just, you know, bumped his chest into the referee's mm-hmm. arm enough that the referee turned and kind of stared him down as the yeah. other people. He saw other Hawks were like, oh no, and grabbed him and tried to get him out of there. Um, so you can't do it. Grant Williams got suspended earlier this season in game. He uh, disagreed with a call, ran up on a referee and bumped into, it was uh, Ashley Moyer Gulch, uh, bumped into her and she threw him out, injected as he should have been. And then he was suspended a game for making, I think the NBA terms it as like inappropriate contact contact mm-hmm. with official or, or something. It, I forget what the exact term is, but it's basically like, hey, if you're making aggressive contact with the ref because you're going at them, like that's going to be a problem. And the reason I bring that up Hawks fans have up and down shared the clip of Jason Tatum got flagrantly fouled by uh, Trey Young. That's who mm-hmm. it was called on. It could have easily been called on Clint Capella. Drove to the to drew to the basket. They both grabbed his right arm and kind of threw him to the ground. Tatum jumped off the floor and went running to he went running to Zach Zarba, the uh-huh. crew chief, to basically say, "Hey, that should be a flagrant foul." And as he did that, the official reached out the the baseline official reached out to grab him and Tatum just kind of pushed his arms off as he was you know, going. And a lot of people are like, well, if you're going to suspend DeJounte Murray, you need to spend Tatum, suspend Tatum. Two completely different things. And mm-hmm. if you can't see the difference there, I don't, I, I, this is, 
you know, emblematic of so many things in you know our world where it's like, nope, I'm only going to see my point of view and nobody else's. They're, they're two different situations. One is I'm trying to get away from the guys. You know, it's not like he was going after Trey Young. We, we often see that's how it goes. It was, hey, I'm trying to get away from it to go tell the crew chief, review this flagrant foul. And the other one was the player stepping to the referee to just scream and yell at him. So I I don't know, you know what, what else to say on the situation other than, you know, it's uh, almost 2.30 here as we're recording this on Monday. If there's going to be any punishment, I'm guessing it will come down soon. They generally yeah. try to do it, a, you know, a day out or so from the game. They play game five tomorrow. Um, I don't know that it really matters. It Maybe it makes it more of a walk for Boston. I think Boston's going to finish the Hawks off anyway. Um, and Murray has been their best player in the series, which also is – that's why you can't do this, right? Yep. If you're your team's best player in a series, you just can't do these sort of things. You gotta you gotta walk off. And it's also a little unclear exactly what he was you know losing his mind about because it's not like the officiating was super uneven throughout the game. The Hawks were in the bonus in the fourth quarter with eight and a half minutes to go. So I'm not entirely sure what he was really you know, losing his mind over. So with the Tatum thing, was that it? I didn't see the angle on it. So is it possible that he didn't know it was an official that was grabbing? Yeah, I, I don't know that he knew it was a ref either. That's, and and that's, that's totally different. Is, if he thinks a teammate is grabbing him, which happens all yeah, the time. All the time, yep. That, you know. And I think the ref grabbed him because I think the ref thought he was trying to get after Trey Young or Clint Capella. Hmm. And I think that's why the ref was like, hey, we're not doing this. And then, you know, and Tatum just kind of, you know, shove. It's, it's kind of like, you know, somebody tries to grab you and shove your way through. Like, sure. that's pretty much what happened here. So. Yeah, it's just I, I don't know, man. This is, you know, I I don't know how you can watch those and basically say those are the same thing. You know, I just I, I don't get where people are coming from with that. So here's the other piece to this, though, right? Because we look at, for example, Dylan Brooks, right? Had the the low ball, low blow. He literally poked the bear with <laughs> with LeBron, um, and he gets kicked out of the game. The NBA mm -hmm. decided he's not going to be suspended for Game Four. Um, but some of the rationale is, well, his punishment was he missed the second half of the game, right? That was that was his punishment. He got ejected from that game. He missed time. What DeJounte Murray just did was after the game was already over. So there isn't really a – like if he yeah. – if the, if the referee said, you know, the game's over and the referee says, that's it, technical foul, you're out. Well, they didn't – they didn't miss – DeJounte Murray didn't miss anything. There's no punishment there aside from the monetary fine that comes with, you know, getting ejected from a game. So that makes me lean more towards he probably misses the next game beyond just, you know, the contact with the official and there being a precedent with that. But also there was no in-game punishment for him because the game had just ended. So I think that may be a factor in this as well. Yeah, I, I, I think so. Like, I think at a bare minimum, he's got a fine coming his way. That's going to happen no matter what. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of ambivalent to whether they suspend him or not. I just wish we'd have consistency, right? If you, mm -hmm. I think if you approached an official at all in a manner of like, Hey, I'm coming at you. Like, and you make contact, make it automatic one game you're out. And that's yeah. generally how it kind of is. Um, same thing is, sorry, if you intentionally kick a dude in the junk, you're out for a game. Like Joel Embiid should have been suspended for a game. Mm -hmm. He ended up missing the game anyway. Um, and the net in the Sixers still won, so it didn't really matter. But he should have been suspended. Dylan Brooks should have been suspended. If, you, it, if it's obvious and intentional, right? It shouldn't just be, well, Draymond Green has history, so we're gonna, you know, send him out. It just should be everybody. And that's where we go. But you know, it kind of is what it is with this stuff, and and we'll see kind of you know where, where it goes from here. All right. Speaking of Dylan Brooks, uh, or as I call him, Villain Brooks, uh, the Grizzlies are looking to move on from Brooks potentially. And this was mentioned by Tim McMahon of ESPN that, look, the, the Grizzlies were trying to find upgrades on the wing, trying to find uh, Mikkel Bridges, looking at uh, OG Ananobi, and they just couldn't get the, the right price. They couldn't find uh, the, the right deal that they wanted. But Brooks is going to be a free agent this summer. Uh, his antics that we've seen so far this season, the leading the NBA in technical fouls. Now what's gone on in the postseason that probably doesn't help his case. Uh, and Memphis may look elsewhere uh, at the wing position. So that's something to keep an eye on here. I do think Brooks is a talented defensive player. He's a good defender. Uh, but I wonder if even Memphis with all the talking they like to do, if, if even they hit a point where they just say, you know what, we kind of want an upgrade on the wing anyway. 
And Brooks, you know, he may be the heart and soul of the team, but at least in the starting lineup, you may need to move on and, and find somebody else to plug in there. Now, again, they tried for a couple of guys at the trade deadline, weren't able to get it done. But I do think this is one of those things that we hear around the trade deadline and then it comes to fruition in the offseason. Yeah, I, here's the challenge. Dylan Brooks is a free agent, so it's yep. very easy. I mean, very easy to move on from him. Just don't yeah, resign him. Just let him don't go. give him a new contract. But yep. then you're losing him for absolutely nothing. And not saying that that's maybe not the way it should go for Memphis. Maybe it is time. But then you're limited in the ways you can replace him. You're essentially looking at your MLE or you're trading other valuable players because that's the only players that have matching salary attached to them in a deal along with likely a pick. I mean, we know they did what, what was the reporting four first round picks for Mikhail Bridges. Yeah. They offered, you know, at least a couple for OG Ananobi, but that was using Dylan Brooks, $11 million contract as, salary. as the salary match. Now you're not going to have that because it's not going to be a sign and trade. I don't know that any teams, unless you, I mean, yeah, you could overwhelm a team with, Hey, do a sign and trade where we send you Dylan Brooks and three first round picks. And then yeah. maybe a team's like, all right, let's go. So I, I'm curious to see how they go. I don't disagree that that spot they should upgrade it much like the Cleveland Cavaliers, two teams that are a lot more similar than I think people realize um, mm. in the way their rosters are constructed much like I harped on them for not using Karis Levert's contract as the piece to go get something, right? Use that as a salary match to go get a good three. I don't know how either one of these teams outside of the MLE upgrades that spot. Now you can upgrade that spot through the MLE for sure. And it's going to be uh, under the new CBA. It'll be about 12.2 million or so. So that's great. But I think your challenge it comes in with this is where are we like we can do that and upgrade the MLE, but like where are we, who, who are we getting with that? You're not getting yeah. a top tier, you know, frontline guy and you're a little limited in what you can trade Cavs again in the same boat, Karis LeVert, a free agent. So unless you're doing a sign and trade, you can't really just throw them in a deal. And that's where this all gets a little bit, a little bit, a little bit messy uh, for Memphis, but it, it makes sense why they would uh, go that direction. Hey, we didn't put on the show sheet. Let's talk about another guy. Um, yeah. Cam Johnson. Right, we didn't put this oh, on the show sheet. Yes, so, uh, reports are the uh, two two different pieces of reporting. One piece from Michael Scotto, a hoop type, which was uh, four four years, ninety million on ninety million is what he thinks he can get. So you know, okay, right, that's that's probably about in range, I think for uh, for him that that you know, would would uh, look at mm -hmm. you, man, you're speedy, um, you know. So that's where you know I feel. feel that's probably about right for, for Cam Johnson, right? That yeah. probably feels pretty good. Yeah. Well, what does that work out to like 22 and a half million or whatever mm -hmm. it is? Um, so that's, and I know those numbers still seem super big. Anytime you get close to a hundred, like it feels like that's like a barrier, but that's just where we're headed in the NBA. Do um, we ever get to a point, this is a different topic, but do we ever get to a point where we just talk about these guys in terms of percentage of the cap? Yeah, I think, you know, it's funny over on spot track. We put that in yeah. on every salary. I love we, did, we put that in as a, as a reference point more like, Hey, let's get, try to get ahead of another giant cap jump now that they've smoothed it and said, Hey, it's only going to be 10%, but still, yeah, you, that, that's the way I try to personally think through these things. Mm -hmm. And then when I, you know, when we see a deal that looks insane this summer, when we're doing our you know, late night live shows, um, <laughs> Kevin Durant got day, traded. What? <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> but when we're doing that, I will, um, you know, I will try to, you know, put it in that frame of reference, right. Of like, Hey, no, that sounds like a big number, but 20 million is only X percent of the cap or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. that's the equivalent to a, you know, $15 million deal there. But the other piece that I thought was interesting is Mark Stein's piece of reporting related to Cam Johnson, which was, they have no intentions of letting him go. The Nets have every mm -hmm. intention of resigning him and matching any offers. So he'll be a restricted free agent. It'll be interesting to see. He's a guy, all of the cap space teams, he makes a ton of sense for all of them. So it wouldn't be surprising if a team forces you know, the Nets hand. It's kind of interesting. A handful of the restricted guys this summer are guys that I think could actually be in play, where a lot of times the restricted market is like, I'm just not going to tie up my space. I'm not going to play in that yeah. world, where I think you know, we may see some actual movement in that one this summer. And, and I think Cam Johnson is a good fit for the Nets moving forward. I do look at their roster, though, and I look at, okay, you've got Mikel Bridges, you've got Cam Johnson, you've got Dorian Finney-Smith, you've got Royce O'Neal. Like, I am all for stockpiling wings. Stockpile them like running backs on your fantasy team. 
right? But even I'm wondering if the Nets <laughs> have uh, uh, yeah, if they have if they if we do see a move here, and I think teams will pay a premium to get three and D style wings, but and any of these guys I think could fetch a, a pretty high price. So I do wonder if there's a move coming for Brooklyn this season where this yeah. summer where either they add some future draft assets or capital that way, or just balance out their roster a little bit by moving one of those four guys. I mean, most likely we're talking Royce O'Neal or Dorian Finney Smith, but and that was some of the reporting there. that Scotto had is it would be likely one yeah. of the right. Mikhail Bridges is going nowhere. He's right now like the new face of the franchise. Um, so yeah. So that leaves out of this group, Dorian Finney Smith, Joe Harris, Cam Johnson, Royce O'Neal, Ben Simmons, maybe. God, yeah, I, I don't, don't even. I don't even think yeah, about him, Keith. I, when I look I at the Nets, I don't yeah. even think about Ben yeah. Simmons. And when I when until I until you see that, that thirty-seven million dollars until I see the cap sheet. Like, oh shit! Right. Yeah. Well, excuse me. I apologize. We try to keep it clean here. <laughs> um, <laughs> that is, oh, that's the first. <laughs> That is I know, a first right? for the NBA front office show. <laughs> yeah, and the entire right. history of the I, show. I, I can find those to you on the before and after we stop recording. <laughs> um, <laughs> there goes my clean cut image, man. Um, you know, so it feels like it's uh, it, it feels like we're in a spot where it is. Um, I, I feel like we're we're looking at this team, and yeah, something's got to give. They've got to move move at least one or two of those guys. I think it was Brian Windhorse maybe suggested Dorian Finney Smith could be a target. Mm-hmm. It's just for the Grizzlies if they let Brooks go. Sure, just how? Like, show me right. the how do you get there part of it. So, so we'll see what that looks like. But yeah, it's a uh, it's interesting. All right, uh, we'll finish things off with this. The Pistons are moving on to the next round of their coaching search. I'll be honest, I've been so locked in on the, the playoffs and everything. This it keeps getting pushed down in my priority list of things to really like pay attention to with all the stuff that's been going on in the playoffs. And now we're getting. Dylan Brooks, the roster move there with Memphis. What could that look like? Uh, the Nets and things. All this stuff is just keeps moving ahead. But yeah, teams are out there looking for coaches right now. Like this is a thing. This is happening. Of course, we know Houston's doing the same thing. What what are the Pistons going to do here? That that's my big question for the for Detroit. It's what is their plan because they came into this past season saying, "Hey, we we're not going to trade Bogdanovich because we feel like." we could maybe start to make a little bit of a run here, maybe get into the play and get some experience. And obviously the injury mm-hmm. to Kate Cunningham derails that, but they were not looking to be a lottery team again. They were looking to make a little bit of a move up, make some progress and then kind of hit the ground running for, for this coming season. Is that still the plan? Is it let's go find a, a veteran coach who's ready to go now? Is it let's go find a younger developmental coach? What do the Pistons do with this coaching search? Yeah, I think it is Charles Lee is in the mix, Kevin Ollie's in the mix, and Jaron mm-hmm. Collins is in the mix. Lee has been – now he's one of those guys who it feels like he's he's kind of doing the uh, previous, like, Ime Udoka, Darvin Ham path of this guy's been interviewed a million times, it feels like, and then it's just waiting for that spot. Steven Silas was there. Wes right. Unsell Jr. was there. I mean, that's kind of what happens with assistants, right? They interview a bunch of times, and then they finally get their chance. He seems like somebody who may be finally going to get his chance. Um, Kevin Ollie, who is the – he's coaching with Overtime Elite right now, kind of the alternate path than the G League Ignite, but he was with the Ignite before. He mm-hmm. was the UConn head coach. Uh, and then Jaron Collins is an assistant with the Pelicans, uh, you know, NBA big man. He's been around. He's been an assistant coach for a while uh, with a couple different clubs. So those guys are all – sound like they're getting second interviews, but at no point I have I seen the reporting basically say they're the finalists. Uh, for the Pistons job. So it may just be, hey, we already had one by, one quick conversation. Let's have another one. But mm-hmm. to your point, Houston's in the mix here with some of these same guys. We don't know exactly where Toronto's heading with their opening just yet. I know it was reported Ime Udoka is the favorite there, um, or at least going to receive you know strong consideration. So, you know, I think it's just kind of all in the mix. And sometimes we know with these things, if you've got somebody you want, you got to move quick because, you know, if you don't, another team may hire them in, in your, instead. Yeah, and that's just it, right? Like you can't you can't wait around for too long if that guy is out there. You gotta go make the move and go get them. And that's why I think for these teams that are interviewing coaches, we look at Houston, we look at Detroit, great, get it, get it done before because look, teams that are in the playoffs, obviously there's gonna be more stability at the coaching situ- coaching spot just inherently, but still it's possible that some of the playoff teams, after they're out, may move on from from their head coaches. 
And if they do, that's just going to create more competition. So if you can get ahead of the game and find your guy and lock that person up before you get into a, a situation where a playoff team may say, you know what, we got knocked out in the first round or something and we really we wanted to go a lot farther. We're going to move on from our coach to avoid that situation. Get it done now before those teams have an opportunity to go do that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, if you can get can get it done. Yeah, just get, get it done. If you have your guy you like, and that's our guy, and we're ready to move forward. Get get it done. Hire them and get get moving. You know, mm -hmm. on this. Yeah, there's no reason to wait. All right, I think that wraps things up for today. Thank you everybody for joining us once again. Smash that like button. Don't forget to subscribe to the NBA Front Office YouTube channel, and of course, over on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever it is you listen to podcasts. Give us a follow there as well. Till next time, everybody. See you and stay safe.